I'm Mark. And I'm Josh. And this is Alter Ego Comics TV, episode number 131. We're coming to you from Lima, Ohio, home of Alter Ego Comics, the one not owned by Mark Wade, the one in Ohio, not the one in Indiana. So stop pestering us. <laughs> Uh, and just as a, as a side note, we're all independently owned. There's not an alter ego chain. Uh, we all just happen to come up with the, that same name around the same time. Uh, there are three or four alter ego comics, to the best of my knowledge. One in Iowa, one in Indiana, one in Ohio, and possibly one in Florida that we sent a cease and desist letter to. So, <laughs> to kick things off this week, let's start. It is, just, first of all, it's a monster week. We mentioned last week how huge a week it is, and now that it's here... I haven't even recovered from how <laughs> how heavy the week was, last, how heavy the stack was of my reading. But we'll start with Forever Evil number one by Jeff Johns and David Finch. And this spins out of the end of the Trinity War event crossover that was th- going through the Justice League books. And as you may recall, I was a fan of that little event that happened. And Forever Evil seems to be a good uh, first issue, a good kicking off point to the series that is asking the question what happens when the heroes are all gone, when the Justice League is gone, and we have the crime syndicate from Earth-3. So this is the first time we've been introduced to any characters from Earth-3 in the New 52 continuity uh, are running the show. And they basically have recruited all the villains in the DC Universe to come and work with them, and not all of them are real happy about it. Uh, Specifically Lex Luthor, who is (laughs) begging and pleading for Superman to please come back. Uh, really solid first issue. If you're a DC fan at all, you need to be reading this. There's no doubt in my mind or his mind or, or anyone's mind uh, that Forever Evil needs to be picked up if you're a DC fan. Uh, in conjunction with Forever Evil, we have Villains Month, which we also spoke about last week. And we've, we're getting 52 different villain one-shots. Some of them appear, appear to be slightly connected to what's going on in Forever Evil. Some of them are just some of them are origin stories for the villains. Some of them are just really solid villain one shots. But they all have these nifty 3D lenticular motion covers, which I have to say are very cool. Now that I've had a chance to see them uh, firsthand, they are incredibly cool, much cooler than I thought they would be. So the people that got to see them in advance when saying they were cool, you are correct. They are cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've been allocated by DC Comics because they didn't print enough to meet demand. Uh, they set their print run before they got orders from retailers, so retailers aren't getting everything that they ordered. Uh, we had enough to go out on the shelf uh, on Wednesday, today's Wednesday by the way, and they probably won't all be here by Thursday or Friday. So if you can get one, great. If you not, if you can't, there are standard 2D covers um, available as well. So did you read any of these villains? Villain I, one-shots? I did. Do you like villains? I, I don't like villains. They're bad guys, mm-hmm. but I like Villains Month. My turn to talk now. <laughs> that's that's not how we do it. That was the cue. For that me. was that was the transition. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a bunch of really cool villains issues out this week. You know, we've got the Joker, we've got Poison Ivy, Two Face, a lot of your key villains. Uh, villains. Yes. Uh, well, Bat villains specifically. It seems like this week, but um, also got just a great d- list of creative teams. And I don't have time to tell you how awesome each individual one is, so I'm picking my favorite, which was the Deadshot number one. Uh, this is Justice League of America 17.1, but that doesn't matter at all. Yeah, right? Yeah. 7.1. I'm sorry, 7.1. Yes. And, uh, but that doesn't matter at all. It has no key ties to the uh, core Justice League of America book other than some cameo appearances, nothing significant to it. If you like Deadshot, if you've been reading Suicide Squad, it's a great read. Uh, like Mark said, a lot of the, well, not a lot, but a significant portion of the uh, Villains Month issues are sort of origins. Uh, A lot of these characters, we haven't seen their origins yet in the New 52 universe. And what we're seeing in in most cases is a contemporaneous story intercut with flashbacks to their origin. Uh, It's very much a a Joss Whedon kind of thing. You know, the monster of the month reflects something personal about the characters that are going through it. Uh, So, you know, we see a current situation that somehow highlights their youth or their upbringing or whatever turned them into a villain. And they're really good. They they walk a great line between, uh, especially the Deadshot one, between making them seem not evil and being evil you know there i mean it's, it's very hard it's well it's very common actually to try and make the villain the hero of his own story and to make him seem noble in their situation and they don't overdo that they do it just enough so that you sort of empathize with them even though you understand they're still evil evil jerks uh and i especially enjoyed the deadshot one because 
it's Deadshot. It's not a terribly deep character, but they made me actually care about him in just a handful of pages. So all the villains months are great, especially Deadshot. It's time for Alter Ego Comics trivia. And I meant to mention this last week and forgot, but for you DC fans, uh, there is a one-shot, a Villains Month one-shot coming out called Joker's Daughter, and I'm not sure which week it ships in. It was not this week. But the character had her first appearance in a DC comic last week that many of our local folks were not aware of. It is Catwoman number 23, contains the first appearance of Joker's Daughter. It is already demanding premium prices on the secondary market, but... We have copies at the store for cover price. So, if you didn't get a chance to pick up Catwoman 23 last week, you want to check out the first appearance of Joker's Daughter, come in. We have at least a few copies left, and we've got some more that should be coming in. All right, so that trivia was brought to you by Joker's Daughter. The next batch for me, it's a twofer. It's X-Men Battle for the Atom, Battle of the Atom. They're not fighting over Adam from Justice League. <laughs> X-Men Battle of the Atom, parts one and two. Now, this is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the X-Men. It is a 10-part crossover event that's going to cross over through four of the X-Men titles and is bookended by uh, Battle of the Atom number one and Battle of the Atom number two, apparently. Um, but it has all of our regular X-Men creators involved, Brian Michael Bendis, Jason Aaron, Brian Wood... Uh, in the, the first part, we get Frank Cho on art duties. The second part takes place in all new X-Men, so we get Stuart Eminent on art duties. And I loved what I've read in these two things. I want to read the next part now. It was fast-paced. It, it tugged on your emotions. It involves characters that every X-Men fan and Marvel fan knows and loves. Basically, to recap... Most of you should know this by now. In all new X-Men, the original five X-Men from the 1960s are brought forward to the present by the Beast, Hank McCoy, so that he can show them how crappy they are, um, how much they've screwed up the world, especially Scott Summers, a.k.a. Cyclops, who has gone rogue and is a murderer, essentially. He's killed Professor X. Granted, it was under the power of, of the Phoenix Force, so he may not have had control over his faculties. Who knows? So he brings the original X-Men to the present, and they are now here. They've decided to stay, and they're learning how to be X-Men at the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning under the tutelage of Kitty Pride. Then you have Cyclops and his team, who are recruiting younger mutants and kind of schooling them in their own way. So we get a visit also from the X-Men of the future, and this is where it starts to get interesting. It was interesting before, but it gets really interesting now. So that team is made up of... Uh, an older Kitty Pride, an older Hank McCoy. Uh, I don't know how much to tell you without spoiling things. Um, other people you will recognize. Other people you will recognize. <laughs> and I, I will I will tell you, oh, well, Deadpool. Um, Deadpool is a member of the X-Men in the future. Uh, and the one that really made me kind of smile and giggle was Molly Hayes from mm -hmm. The Runaways. So Molly from The Runaways, and Runaways is one of our favorites here at the store uh, that really doesn't get enough love, I don't think. And then there's a mystery character that I don't want to spoil, and it's revealed at the end of one of the issues. So you'll get to find out, and it's kind of sort of cool. So this was a very long-winded uh, explanation of X-Men Battle of the Atom, but you really need to check it out. If you're an X-Men fan, similar to what I said about Forever Evil, every X-Men fan needs to be checking out Battle of the Atom. It's very well written, it's got great artwork, and it's got tons of characters that everybody knows and loves. What else do you need? <laughs> Kitty Pride from the future. She anyway. looks kind of rough. Too. Well, she looks basically like she did in Days of Future Past. Yeah, which, which she's I got liked. that gray and silver in her hair, and she's wearing the same outfit. Yeah, basically. Um, they only have one store in the future. Looked like she got punched in the face a few times. Though. Yeah, well, she's a little. We don't know exactly the timeline that they're being pulled from. So and she Beast could be, she could like be a, a little older. Beast has like a goat horn coming out. Beast of apparently side. never stops mutating. Beast is in bad shape, man. He thought Deadpool was in bad shape. At least before he had symmetry, but now he's got like one horn over here and like a bird foot. I, I don't know how that happened. Molly Hayes. Got, <laughs> Molly Hayes, with yeah. Uh, next up is uh, our weekly valent, valiant. I love you too. Uh, Quantum and Woody number three. It's <laughs> it's still really good. <laughs> Uh, the Quantum and Woody number three. This is uh, we've got to the point where the kind of initial origin-y stuff is is kind of wrapping up, and you see them fighting as brothers do, and splitting up a little bit, going their separate ways, taking different uh, trains, and we also start to see the reveal of who the actual bad guy is. And 
And uh, all that's really cool and fun and drives the plot forward, but mostly the book is hilarious. Uh, there were several jokes this week that made me just laugh out loud, and it's, it's the most fun I had reading a comic this week. No disrespect to Battle of the Atom, which was also fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right, another heavy hitter this week that has been greatly anticipated by many people is the Star Wars number one. This is an eight issue miniseries adapting George Lucas's rough draft of the original Star Wars screen screenplay. So this is uh, his rough draft that was written in 1974 and many elements of the original Star Wars trilogy are present. Um, we basically have Luke Skywalker taking on the role of Obi-Wan Kenobi. We have the Luke character is portrayed by Anakin Starkiller. Han Solo is a green lizard type guy. Uh, we get some other people in here. Darth Vader is not in the armor at this point, but there is a Sith that looks like Darth Malgus from a little bit, yeah. whatever that's from. Uh, uh, Old Republic. Old Republic. So to, this is my week to say, if you are a fan of blank, then you can't miss blank. So with me now. <laughs> if you're a Star Wars fan, you cannot miss the Star Wars number one. It's a stupid name, I'll give you that. The Star <laughs> Wars. It's just, I, I feel weird even saying the Star Wars. It's like the Batman. But uh, I think that fans of Star Wars will find so much to love in this book. The little nods to uh, the way, again, the original trilogy uh, appeared, and also because there's been so much done in the Star Wars universe since the time this rough draft was written, you know, bits and pieces have been used in other Star Wars material that's been published. You know, the name Starkiller is used in uh, something. Help me out. Never mind. Uh, as I said, one of the Sith lords in here appears to be Darth Malgus, or looks a lot like Darth Malgus. So if you're a Star Wars fan, you have to pick up the Star Wars. Uh, and I have to tell you that the artwork by Mike Mayhew, possibly related to Peter Mayhew, who played <laughs> Chewbacca, I don't know, but is beautiful. Uh, it is some crazy good artwork in this. I enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? I did. That was my selling point in this book. The, the art was really good. Um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so I just enjoyed the heck out of it. I had little fanboy squee moments. and There were lots of squees. There were squees. It was bad. I mean, the book was good, but I was a sad little girl man. Anyway. Carry on. Carry on, my wayward son. Next up is uh, The Mocking Dead, number one. Uh, this is a new book from... I don't even know who's publishing this. Dynamite! Dynamite? Yes. Oh, it would help if you put a symbol on your cover, guys. Uh, <laughs> it says it up here. There's the, your the website the address, print. but there's nothing on here. <laughs> Oh, well. Here's dynamite.com. Uh, the Mocking Dead uh, obviously sounds like it's a humor book about zombies, and it's not. I mean, it certainly has humorous elements, but uh, it's not like an over-the-top spoof. It's an actual legitimate you know, zombie story. So this takes place in a universe where at some point in the past, the government had a, force, a task force or a think tank called Tinseltown. Uh, they're, basically, they said, you know, Every year, millions of movies and books and TV shows come out, and they detail terrorist attacks. They detail bad things that happen, you know. And we see this in the real world. Uh, Tom Clancy had a book about flying planes into high-rise buildings. Um, our boy Greg Rucka wrote uh, in one of his Queen and Country books about bombings in the London subway that were eerily echoed years later by actual terrorists. So the plan is to develop a think tank to study popular culture, to study media and see what's viable. See, oh, this would really work or this wouldn't, and if this does work, how do we fight it? Uh, and it's divided into two divisions. You've got a division based on real-world kind of terrorist stuff and the genre division, which covers things like Star Wars and zombies and The Wizard of Oz, and it's just so good. Basically, you have a fanboy trying to save the universe because he knows a lot about things. And the Z dead start to rise, so they call in one of the experts who's been debarred to uh, try and straighten things out with their crazy plans. And it's just it's just great. It's Every page is a stack of references to pop culture, to comics, to movies, to things we love. And it's just really compelling, fun, fresh book. So good job, Dynamite. And Fred Van Lente. What are these five simple steps that will help stop a global outbreak? Brush your teeth, wash your hands, don't pick your nose. I don't know what this one Trim is. Trim your nose hair? I don't know. Uh, don't go scuba diving and don't take a dump. I don't know. There's a guy hovering over He's hovering toilet. over the toilet. Toilet seats apparently transmit. I don't know. I, I don't know. I have concerns. Seek out the cover to this because, well, you'll see it. We'll, yeah. we'll put it up it's on, on the screen. screen. But uh, I want to know what that last person is doing. Is that they jumping that's, off a toilet? That's the they... hover, yeah. And apparently he's sweating. Or that might be a ponytail. Is that a ponytail? Is that it a could woman? be a ponytail. I don't know. All right. 
We're spending a lot of time talking about this. <laughs> uh, another great number one this week is from DC Comics. It is the return of Batman Black and White. And this Batman Black and White is an anthology series uh, done in black and white, so it's not colored. Um, and there have been three volumes, three collected editions over the years, so this is would be the fourth volume. But again, it's a it's a single issue. Six issues are going to be in this volume, and it's basically some of the best writers and artists in comics doing short stories about Batman. And in this issue, we get a, a great cover by Mark Silvestri. We get oh, there are no names on this page. We get uh, let's see, Chip Kidd, who is an Eisner Award winning uh, DC Comics fanatic writing a story illustrated by Michael Cho, and Michael Cho's artwork is very reminiscent of Darwin Cook. It looks very cool. Uh, we get Batman Zombie, written and illustrated by Neil Adams. And in the past, we've been a little harsh on Neil Adams, and I think it's because he's inking his own work, and his his raw pencils are significantly better than him inking himself. No offense, Mr. Adams, uh, because I know you watch this. <laughs> You're, so you get to see Adams' pencils in here, and they are really, really good. Uh, we get Justice is Served, which is written by Maris Wicks, and she, this is her first published DC Comics work. She's done a lot of a lot of stuff for uh, first second books, uh, and it's illustrated by Joe Canones, who's also a very cool Batman artist. We is that get the Harley and Ivy story. Yes, it is. Yeah, yes, it that is. was. Really cool. We get uh, Driven, written by John Arcudi, who's done a lot of stuff in the Mike Mignola Hellboy universe, illustrated by Sean Murphy who did Punk Rock Jesus and American Vampire. And finally, Head Games, written by uh, longtime Marvel writer Howard Mackey, who uh, gave us the Dan Ketch Ghost Rider back in the late 80s, early 90s, and illustrated by Chris Samney, one of our favorites from over uh, at Daredevil. This is his first published Batman work. So lots of firsts in this issue, and it is really good, really solid. Uh, the great thing about this series is I can give it to a Batman fan who hasn't, who doesn't know anything about Batman comics, who hasn't read Batman before, or who's been away from Batman for a while, and you can jump into this and you're off and running because you've got a handful of short stories that are really, the, number one, they're not connected to each other. Number two, they take place during different time periods. Um, so they can be enjoyed on their own. So you can pick up this issue and enjoy it for what it is and appreciate the black and white artwork in here because that's really the selling point on this book is the artwork, that's why they call it black and white, and it is excellent. All right, and there were so many awesome books this week that we don't have time to go through all, but a couple quick highlights. We've got DC Universe versus Masters of the Universe. Lots of universe going on in there. Uh, essentially, the Justice League and the uh, Masters of the Universe crossover. It's penned by Keith Giffen, who has a long tradition at DC and has also been writing several of the, the recent Masters of the Universe books, and it's just a joy. If you like either one, seeing them mashed together is even better. Uh, also, if you're a John Constantine fan, there is an excellent moment in here with Skeletor. And our other must-read this, well, our other uh, also ran this week that didn't quite make the top ten, but is certainly worth checking out, is God is Dead from Avatar, written by Jonathan Hickman and Mike Costa, who you may remember from such books as uh, the Fantastic Four when it first rebooted, the current New Avengers and regular Avengers, and of course Manhattan Projects for Hickman. And Mike Costa did uh, the wonderful G.I. Joe Cobra and the, um, what was the name of the magic series? Smoke and Mirrors. Smoke and Mirrors, yes. which we loved. Uh, we've got art by... That person. Diamorum. 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 Anyway. Uh, God is Dead is about uh, a second coming, a uh, resurrection in which a lot of the old pantheons, the old gods, your Aztecs, your uh, Greeks, your Norse gods, come back to Earth and decide to, you know, take it over and be gods again. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's very cool, especially if you have a mythology background. There's a lot of little nods here and there, a lot of cool tweaks. So uh, excited to see what Hickman and Costa do with this one. We literally could talk for an hour about all the <laughs> comics that came out this week, but we don't have the time. Uh, so, if you're a fan of Infinity, Infinity continues this week. We got Infinity number two. We got more villains, one shots that you can shake a stick at. We got all the stuff we talked about. Uh, so, you really should come in and check this stuff out or head to your local comic book store and do that. Just a quick reminder about a couple upcoming events. We've got our previews night uh, coming up on September 11th at 7 o'clock at the store where we're going to go through the previews catalog, give you our recommendations, and answer your questions. We've got our first ever ladies night on September 19th. Excuse me, that's from seven until nine. We're inviting uh, the ladies to come in, whether you have an interest in comics, whether you're looking at comics for your children, we're here 
we're here to help. We're ready to believe you. <laughs> we are uh, ready to answer your questions and give recommendations and point you in the right direction in the world of comics. And then finally, our A Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. premiere party coming up on September 24th from 7 until 9 p.m. over at the Met. We're going to have door prizes. They're going to be drink specials and food spe specials. And it's just a great way to watch this, this new show in the presence of your fellow geeks. So, oh, I just can't talk anymore. It's something in my throat. Thanks for watching. See ya next time. Thank you.